Today we're in chapter 1, and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 14 as we consider, uh, continue our study here in the, the book of Hebrews. So let's begin reading here in Hebrews chapter 1 at verse 4. I'll read to uh, verse 14. We'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, reading to verse 14. The writer writes, "...having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now, Last time we were together and we did our introduction, we looked at verses 1 through 3. And as we examined verses 1 through 3, I, I took the time to point out that the writer wanted his readers to know something. He wanted his readers from the very beginning to know that Jesus is better. I mentioned to you that the writer of Hebrews used the word better some 13 times in this epistle. He wanted his Jewish readers to resist returning to the law of Moses. And he wanted them to know that, that the law is inferior to the grace that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. As we went through the first three verses, uh, we found a sevenfold description of Jesus Christ. And, and in those descriptions, Jesus was revealed as being superior. He's superior or better than the prophets of the Old Testament. And the description of Jesus concluded with him being seated at the right hand of God. And as we looked at that, I pointed out that his being seated revealed a completed work and that salvation is now accomplished because of him. He sits at the right hand of God because that's a place of honor and authority, a place of special favor. So as we pick up now in verse 4, he continues and he begins here in verse 4 with the words, having become so much better than the angels. He's established the superiority over the prophets because he's the son of God. Now he develops his superiority or being better than the angels. Now, notice how he says, having become, having become so much better than the angels as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I want to point out something very basic as we begin here. Having become would speak of his incarnation. Having become speaks of his incarnation. I'm going to have to develop that with you for just a moment because prior to his incarnation, Jesus Christ is regarded as what is called the eternal son. And as the eternal son has always been better than the angels, he has always been superior to the angels. There's never been a time when he has been less than the angels. He was the eternal son better than the angels. Now, there is a religious group that attempts to say that, and, and most of you already know this, so I'll say this very briefly, that attempts to teach, as a matter of fact, has been teaching for some time, that Jesus Christ is actually an angel. And some of you already know that in the event that you don't. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that he is Michael, the archangel. I know this through reading their material. I know this through discussing it with them on a personal basis. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God and that he is Michael, the archangel. That is something that they teach. That's something that they hold fast to. And yet, as we look at this passage, it's quite obvious that Jesus Christ is better than the angels. And I want to point that out to you very briefly, because you might, inevitably you will, have a discussion one day with a, a Jehovah's Witness, and I wanted to point something out. Jesus has always been better than the angels, and Jesus Christ has authority that the angels never had. It's interesting, in the New Testament book of Jude, 
Uh, Jude is a very exciting book. It's something that, that uh, Paul McCartney liked an awful lot. He even wrote a song about it, called it Hey Jude. But anyway, the book of Jude, that was a joke. You're supposed to laugh. Um, Jude in verse 9, and uh, I'm not going to turn you there. I'll just, I'll just speak to you out of memory. Jude in verse 9 speaks about Michael the archangel disputing with Satan over the body of Moses, dared not render a railing accusation, but rather said, the Lord rebuke you. You find that in the book of Jude, verse 9. And I want you to think about it for a minute because there's actually something I'm trying to teach you here very briefly. Michael the archangel arguing, disputing over the body of Moses did not render a railing accusation, but rather said, and I want you to hear this, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael, though he is a mighty angel, did not have authority to rebuke Satan and therefore called on the one who does. That's why it says that he said, the Lord rebuke you. Why is that important to point out? Well, one, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel, and in that passage of Scripture, it states that he didn't have the ability, Michael did not have the ability, to uh, actually uh, confront Satan in and of himself, and therefore calls upon the Lord to bring the rebuke. But when Jesus, in his incarnation, is being tempted by Satan, at one point Satan is attempting to get him to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, and even goes so far as to say that God shall give the angels charge concerning you uh, lest you dash your foot, and they will hold you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 10, says, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. Now, wait a minute. If Jesus is Michael the archangel, and Jude 9 tells us that he did not do anything in his own authority, but rather said, The Lord rebuke you. Well, the question has to be asked, then, why would Jesus Christ not, why would Jesus Christ say, get thee behind me, which is a rebuke. Why did Jesus not say, the Lord rebuke you? And the obvious answer is, it's because Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is the one with that authority. You see, that's the whole point that he's making here in Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's not a lower creation. He's the one who created all things. And so, Jesus Christ has always been better than the angels. In his incarnation, when he became human flesh, he took upon himself a second nature, the second nature being human. He became man. So in his incarnation as man, he is placed in position that is referred to as a little lower than the angels. You see that in verse 9 of chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. In his incarnation, Jesus Christ, in order to suffer death on our behalf, is presented as being in his incarnation in that position. But the bottom line is, after his ascension and his being seated at the right hand of the Father, completing the work of redemption, he is exalted and he is preeminent. That's why the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, the writer wants us to know that Jesus is better, that he is superior, he's more excellent than the angels. That's an important point, and you need to know why. One is because in the uh, history of Israel, their prophets were absolutely important to them, though Jesus asked on one occasion, which of your prophets did you not kill? They are still in their lore and in the way they see things. The prophets were extremely important. That's why Jesus is better than the prophets, but not only that. But to the Jews, the angels were extremely important also. They believed that they had an involvement in the giving of the law. You see that in Galatians in chapter 3, verse 19. And the Jews considered the, uh, the angels to be very important in their history. Some felt them to be so transcendent that they considered them closest to God in that they believed them to be present with him when he completed all of creation. Now, this is another important point for you. Because they interpreted Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God says in that passage, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The Hebrew rabbis interpreted that to mean that, that God was speaking to the angels. 
And so, and I want you to think about this for a minute because I'm giving you something that's a little deeper than normal. I, I'm trying to bring something to you because they were saying, well, if Genesis 126 is that, that, that man is made in the image of God, who is he speaking to when he says, let us make man in our image? Who is he speaking to? Well, because they would not regard Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. Naturally, they'd have to find a group of people that they would be saying God was speaking to. So who did they say that God was speaking to in creation? They would say that he was speaking to the angels. And so they thought that they were part of the creation. Well, the problem is, is it didn't work that way. Because the Bible in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 says this, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. Now listen, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. The angels were not involved in the creation of the heavens and the earth. They are part of the creation. So who would he be speaking to? Who would God be speaking to when he said, let us make man in our image? Well, in Colossians, we get the answer. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Because Paul writes and says, For by Jesus all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. When, the God, when God was speaking concerning let us make man in our image, he was speaking within the confines of the Godhead. He wasn't speaking to angels at all, but he was speaking to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, as you study the Bible, you're going to see that angels are mentioned quite frequently in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I counted out some 273 references to angels in the Bible. There are 108 direct references in the Old Testament, and there are 165 in the New. As you read, you get an uh, opportunity to see what angels are like, and if you take notes, I want to give you 10 things about angels as I develop my introduction here concerning Jesus being superior. 10 things about angels. And uh, all of this obviously is very important. Um, one of the things that we see in Scripture is they don't have bodies of flesh and bone. They don't have bodies of flesh and bone. In Luke chapter 24, verse 39, behold, Jesus is speaking, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Let me give you something else for that. Seems like I'm going to pick on people today. Might as well speak about the Mormons for a moment. <laughs> Some of the nicest, sweetest kids I've ever talked to. Seriously. And uh, very sacrificial. Very sacrificial. On their own dime, they go on missions. They go into neighborhoods that a lot of people won't go into. They believe very firmly in what they're teaching. They believe that with all of their heart. You can't help but respect somebody who is a young man or a young woman who puts their faith into action. Unfortunately, they're believing the wrong thing. I've had uh, conversations on many occasions with Mormons, both young and as I've grown older. And, and I can still remember having some young men at my house when I was a young man. I was 22 years old at the time, 23. And uh, they stopped by my house, and they wanted to share with me the gospel, the Mormon gospel. And, and a friend of mine and I were there in my parents' uh, den, and uh, they came in. They had a flannel board, and they began to share with me about their prophet, Joseph Smith. And I remember this conversation very well because they, they showed me this, uh, this, uh, this glade, this forest, and they said Joseph was there asking God uh, which religion is true. And and, uh, and then they got a little flannel uh, person, and they placed it on the flannel ground there, and they said, and God spoke to Joseph, and then they took another uh, little flannel character, placed it next to God, and it was Jesus. They looked identical, by the way. And he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And I said, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, how is it that you're saying that God has a body? In Mormonism, Mormons teach that God has a physical body. I said, how is it that you are saying that God has a body? They said, well, God does have a body. I said, the Scripture doesn't teach that. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus tells me, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And so I said, how can you say that God has a body of flesh and bones, which you're portraying to me right now on that flannel gram, 
When the Bible says the spirit does not have a body of flesh and bones, and you're presenting him as if he does. And the guy got very, very angry. And uh, it was an interesting time that we had there in my father's den. But he was very angry because he didn't have an answer for that. You see, the bottom line is, is angels do not have bodies of flesh and bone. Jesus made that very clear. They are spirits. But secondly, they can appear in human form. They can appear as if they do have a human body. This is seen various times in Scripture from the old to the new. The angels uh, announced the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, there are various times in Scripture that, uh, that angels will appear and you will see them as physical beings. And so, though they have bodies, they, they have a spirit body, do not have a body of flesh and bone, they can appear in human form, and you see that in Scripture. Uh, they also have a tremendous glory about them, so much glory that they, they actually frighten men. You know, every once in a while, I'll hear somebody give a spectacular testimony of how angels have visited them. And, and I say, that is, that is absolutely nonsensical, you know, uh, if there's no fear involved. Uh, I remember hearing of one, a story, true story, of a, a man speaking to John MacArthur, how that he says every morning, you know, he has a visitation. He said, Jesus comes and stands next to me every morning when I'm shaving. And he said to John MacArthur, do you believe that? And John MacArthur said back to the man, no, I don't. But what frightens me most is I think that you do. You know, I think that sometimes we get these fantastic ideas that we're having spiritual experiences, but when you read Scripture, it really causes people great fear when angels actually do appear. Uh, in Matthew 28, verse 3 and 4, the Bible speaking of uh, an angel says, his appearance was like lightning, his garment as white as snow. The guards shook of, for fear of him and became like dead men. And so we see that they don't have, uh, uh, have physical bodies, but rather our spirit. They can appear in human form, but when they do, they frighten people. We also know that they communicate. We know that Gabriel spoke both to Joseph concerning the uh, pregnancy of his betrothed wife as well as speaking to, to Mary. We know that uh, they do not marry, but they have a fixed number. They don't increase. We know that they're not subject to physical death. We know that they were created before man because the fall of Satan occurred in heaven. And we know that the angels uh, who did not fall reside in heaven. We know that they are more powerful uh, than man, and, and we must call on God to help us whenever a demonic angel is, is after us. And finally, they minister to believers by delivering from danger or assisting us when prayer is being answered. And you see that in verse 14 of the same chapter here when it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who inherit salvation? So angels have a tremendous role in Scripture. You see it from the old into the new. And the Jews at that time felt that they had something to do with the giving of the law, and they also believed them to be part of, the, uh, of creation in that God spoke to them as he was creating. And so in their mind, the angels are tremendous. And that's the whole point that he's making here. Again, back in verse 4, it says, Speaking of Jesus, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And so he's saying Jesus is better than angels. The Jews think that prophets are incredibly important, and they are. The Jews believe that angels are incredibly important in the economy of God, and they are. But he's saying Jesus is better than both the prophets, and Jesus is better than angels. Now, when he says by inheritance he's obtained a more excellent name than they, it's not the, just the name Jesus. I mean, there are people in the Old Testament who have the same name, Joshua, and that's Jesus' name. I mean, in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua, but it is Joshua. And so it's not just the name Joshua. There are others who are named Joshua. It's not saying that that name Joshua is superior, we'll say, to Michael or Gabriel. What he's actually saying is that he has, by inheritance, obtained a name because he's the son of God. Notice verse 5, he says, for, which, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Angels were created to minister to God. None are ever called his son. So Jesus is called the Son of God, therefore his name is superior. Now, as he brings this out to us, he's actually quoting two different scriptures. He's quoting Psalm 2, verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And 2 Samuel 7, 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And so in a general sense, angels can be called the sons of God, but never in an individual sense. 
You will see that on occasion, especially in the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, the, uh, the sons of God appear before God. But that is a general sense, not in a singular sense, not in an individual sense. And so he speaks concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I wanna develop this a bit with you. When he says in verse 5, you are my son, today I have begotten you, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. The immediate thing as you read that, you might be thinking that he's referring to the incarnation when Jesus took upon himself human flesh. That's not what he's speaking about. He's not referring to his birth, he's referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, we read, we tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. He's speaking concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and became the firstborn. And that's what's referred to when we get to verse 6 when he says he brings the firstborn into the world. And he says, let all the angels of God worship him. You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected, Jesus Christ was publicly declared to be the Son of God. If you take notes, Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear, verses 3 and 4. As to his human nature, he was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Jesus Christ has declared the Son of God through the power of the resurrection. And that's why it says in verse 5, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. Originally these words were spoken to King David. They related to the son who would reign. They didn't refer to Solomon though, but to his greater son who would be Jesus, the son of David. Now, in verse 6, when he says, he, he again brings the firstborn into the world and says, let all the angels of God worship him, this demonstrates, once again, his superiority because the angels of God are ordered to worship Jesus Christ. Now, all through the Bible, God makes it very clear that there's only one that you worship. I am the Lord, and you shall worship me, God says in his law. There's nowhere, anywhere in any scripture that says that we give any kind of obeisance or worship to any created being. Nowhere do you find any commandment whatsoever that I should ever bow my knee to a created being. I recognize angels as being ministering spirits. And therefore, when I kneel to anyone, it is to the Lord God. In Exodus 34, 14, you shall worship no other God. The Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. So angels are never worshiped. They are created by God and are never given what belongs to him, which is worship. It's an there's an interesting story found in the book of Revelation. When John was receiving um, different kinds of revelation, the one who is giving him the revelation, John falls at his face. He says, I fell at his feet, rather, to worship him. And he said to me, see that you do not do it. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. And he goes on and says, worship God. And so, no matter how glorious and how much splendor and how much incredible worth an angel has because he is incredible in that way, I am never to worship him. I don't pray to him. I don't ask an angel for help. I, I don't do any of that. I, I, I look to God to do that. I, I, and I, I pray to God. I say, God, in Jesus' name, I need you to deliver me. Now, he may send an angel to do that. And uh, you find that in Scripture that on occasion he does. But in terms of, of me worshiping and giving glory to and falling down, even as John did at the, the feet of the one who had given him this revelation, the angel immediately says, worship is reserved for God. You do not give to a created being that which belongs to God. And so we have to be careful about that. Now, again in verse 6, it says, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That word firstborn is a Greek word, prototokos. It's a messianic title. It, it isn't speaking of time as if it was the first one born. It speaks of superiority of position, the firstborn. And in superiority of position, Jesus Christ is being presented as positionally being worthy of our worship. You know, again, sometimes people will say, now look, this is the word firstborn. That means that he's the first creation of God. That's not what the Bible is saying. 
But the Bible is simply saying here, it says he's worthy of our praise and our worship. Now, when it says, let all the angels of God worship him, when do all the angels worship Jesus? Well, one, in, in one sense, they always have. They worship him because he's God and they all worship to him. But this passage will be fulfilled at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Matthew 16, 27 says, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. He shall reward every man according to his works. They worship him in full glory as he completes his work. Now, notice in verse 7, notice how it says, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He is superior because he has a superior nature over angels. This reveals the difference in the basic nature of angels and Jesus. Notice it says, he makes, who makes his angels. That word makes speaks of creation. He created the angels, spirits, and his ministers of flame of fire. So the angels were created, and as God, Jesus is uncreated. He created the heavens and the earth, and he also created the principalities and the powers. But to the Son, verse 8, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. The throne Jesus occupies is eternal. He is forever Lord. He is forever sovereign ruler. And that is the overwhelming testimony of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the one who is forever to be worshipped. In 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, Paul said, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He, speaking of God, appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. And so he is the eternal one who is worshipped. When it speaks of the scepter, that's the governing power and authority. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Jesus had a relationship with his Father that was unique. He is the unique Son of God, and that's why he's referred to as God, your God. But he is superior. In verse 10 to verse 12, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. Jesus predates angels, and he will outlast creation. He brings the universe to its consummation. He's going to roll it up like an old garment. What an interesting picture that is. My son David um, moved out several months ago, lives uh, with a friend of his, and uh, he had... Uh, he has a dog, a Rottweiler. Now, let me tell you something about that Rottweiler, by the way. I just thought of it. Rottweiler doesn't know it's a Rottweiler. It's a big dog. Weighs 100 and some pounds. Good-sized girl. Um, doesn't know she's a Rottweiler. I took her for a walk here on the church campus. It's been a while now. She was not just a pup, but she was not full-grown either. And as we were walking together, I walked out to the side here to the home that's closest to the freeway over here. And uh, the person who owns that home has some geese. And uh, so Sammy, the dog's name is Sammy, Sammy and I are taking a walk. And as we're walking by the fence, I could look in there and I saw a, a goose and, and, and his, his mate. And his mate had laid some eggs. And everybody knows that that geese are like watch geese, you know, they're, they, they're, you know, they're very protective. And so as I was walking by the fence there, there's this goose, and that goose probably weighs about, you know, 10 pounds or whatever a goose weighs. Um, and as the goose was there, that goose sees the dog. And Sammy's a Rottweiler, keep that in mind. And so as we're walking by the fence, the goose sees the dog. And he immediately gets between uh, the dog and the eggs. And I'm starting to get kind of fascinated. I'm wondering what's going to happen here when Sammy notices this goose. And as we're walking by the fence, the goose, you know, puts his wings out. And he he's kind of stands on his, his 
reel as tall as he could and starts flapping his wings. And there's a fence between the dog and that goose. And the fence is, is high enough, you know, for even if that goose went right at her, that goose is going to hit the fence. And, uh, but Sammy doesn't know that. And so when that goose stuck its arms and started doing this, Sammy looks at it, and then he honks. And when he honks, man, I, I was, I'm being dragged around the parking lot by a dog that's running. It's a Rottweiler. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, you yeah, know, this has nothing to do with the Bible study. It's just a story. But I, I started thinking about that. I thought, you know, I am so much like Sammy. Yeah, I'm so much like this dog. One, that goose, even if it could get through a fence, once it got to Sammy, it would just be roast goose, you know, because Sammy could eat that goose. But Sammy didn't realize that she's a Rottweiler. So because she didn't realize she's a Rottweiler, she's running away from a bluff because that goose couldn't even get to her. And the Lord ministered. You know, it's funny how the Lord will minister things to you. Maybe it doesn't to you, but he does to me. And, you know, and he's telling me, you know, in Christ, you're a Rottweiler. And there's no way that the enemy can get to you through that fence, which is Jesus Christ. So in order for him to try and and, 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 and cause, he causes you fear to think that he can, and you take off running. I'll tell you, I get some spiritual stories from God in the weirdest ways, and that's one of them. I thought, you know, I'm just like Sammy. I mean, there's no way that that enemy can get to me. God's already protecting me, but I don't know who I am in Jesus Christ. But anyway, David has a Rottweiler, and he would let the dog sleep in his room. I let the dog sleep in his room, and... There is a, a rug that we put her cage because she would actually sleep inside of her little, her little cage there. Eventually, we just open it up and she'd sleep next to him. And uh, she decided to chew up the rug. And so she chewed up that rug because, well, well, why not? You know, rugs are there. They're meant to be chewed up, I guess. She chewed it all up. And what I eventually did is I came in and I pulled that rug out, I rolled it up, and I threw it away. That's the picture that we have right here. That's the picture he's given us. Like a cloak, you will fold them up. They will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Except he's not talking about a ratty old rug. He's talking about the universe. That's intended to give you and me an incredible idea of how powerful Jesus Christ is. He's not talking about some rug. He's talking about the universe itself. In the beginning, you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. You remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You'll fold them up. That gives us a picture of how powerful Jesus Christ is. No angel can do something like that. And finally, verse 13, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? The answer, obviously, to no angel has he ever said that, only to the Son, then he goes on and says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Ultimately, he conquers. He conquers all his enemies. Everything in the universe worships him. There was this commercial that we used to see every once in a while where this fellow was speaking about taking care of your car, and he was playing the part of a, a mechanic, and he would say to me, say to us in the commercial, You need to take care of your car. He says, well, think about it. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. And the point was, if you don't take care of your car, eventually you're going to have to take it in, and not just for some basic service, you know, maintenance, but you're going to have it, have it repaired. And I've thought about that often in various ways, and I realize that that's the bottom line. You know, the Bible says very clearly that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Very clearly that we enunciate that Jesus Christ is Lord, which is uh, by believing that God raised him from the dead, uh, we believe and pronounce him Lord in our life, and that is a confession of salvation. Ultimately, all humanity is going to say Jesus Christ is Lord, even those who've rejected him on earth, even those who have said that he is not Lord. I find it fascinating, and, and some of you may too, how that if the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, which it does in Philippians chapter 2, then that means that every human being who's ever lived will make that pronouncement. Now, I do that now willingly. I, I did that in the day that I got saved. I, I, I confessed the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
I said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. And based on your word, which you state to me that if I trust in you, I can be born again, my sins will be washed clean, I'll have a relationship with you because of Christ, I recognize you as being the Lord, the Lord of my life, and therefore, Jesus, you are Lord. And by the Spirit of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I make that profession of faith. And so I have recognized, and so have you if you're born again, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I have done that willingly. And in doing so, here on this, on this earth, when I see Jesus Christ, I see him as my Savior. One of these days, we will look at him face to face. One of these days, we will have opportunity to be there with him in heaven. And, and when we are there with him in heaven, he shall make us to be able to stand in his presence. And as we stand in his presence, because he makes us to stand, we will worship him for eternity. He's our Lord. And we will have recognized that. And we will say, God, I recognize you as my Lord when I was walking on the face of the earth. And for eternity, I will recognize you as my Lord. And in that, I have been saved. And in that, there's no fear. There's no fear at all in that. Because perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. I will not have fear when I see the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll have joy and I'll have peace and I'm, I'm going to be rewarded and it's going to be an incredible moment when you see the Lord for the very first time. When you look upon that one who died for you, there's going to be nothing but love and, and a sense of peace and, and it's going to overwhelm you in such an incredible way and, and you're going to be so blessed you're in heaven because of what he's done. And you will say willingly, you are my Lord, even as you've already practiced so many times here on this, on this earth. But you want to know something. Others will do that too, but it will not be in the same way that you say it. You're going to say something like, or I would say something like, you are Lord. But there are others who will say it differently. You are Lord. And a recognition of the reality of that, that he is Lord, which tells me that all human beings who've ever lived, that includes Buddha, that includes Muhammad, that includes every human being who will recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the Christian message. That's why people don't like us. Because that's what Jesus taught. That's what the writer of Hebrews is teaching, that Jesus Christ is better. He is better than any Jewish prophet. And think of them all if you'd like. Consider from the beginning all the way back. Think about all the prophets to... Uh, to the apostles, every individual who, who was used by God, men like Samuel and, and Jeremiah and, and Elijah and Elisha, I mean, you can name them all, all of these men and, and prophetesses who were used of God throughout the Old into the New Testament, Jesus is better. Not only is he better than the spokesmen and spokeswomen of God, but he is better than the angels of God, the angels of God that the Jewish nation regarded so highly, for they were, in their belief, involved in the distribution of the law. They believed that they were involved somehow in creation. They recognized them as preeminent. The writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than prophets. Jesus is better than angels. Because to which angel did he ever say, let all the angels of God worship him? Not a single angel is worshiped. Only God is worshiped. And the whole point he's making is he is superior to prophets and superior to angels because he is God in the flesh, which makes him superior.